Very close to that date is my own anniversary as the pastor of Baraka Church. At the present time, of course, I am not well, and it's going to be rather difficult to communicate in the usual fashion, but I think we'll manage it for this service. Last Friday night, 7 May, I finished 21 years as pastor of Baraka Church. Now, during that particular time, it's inevitable that one will recall what happens during such a tenure. And I've seen God's grace and God's faithfulness every day of those 21 years. The circumstances have not always been pleasant. They've never been dull. And probably the verse with which I have lived the closest is Isaiah 54:17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. That's the way it begins. That's not the way it ends. It is a passage dealing with the authority of a communicator of doctrine. It is a passage that applies in this church age, even as it applied in the age of Israel to Isaiah. I began as a pastor. In fact, this is really my only pastorate. But I again began pastoral life in a Quonset hut downtown. And those first years were years of struggle against legalism and pettiness and superficialities. It was also a time of the crystallization and the determining of the course of my own ministry. The importance of teaching the Word of God, communicating God's Word on an exegetical, categorical basis led to the starting of Bible classes downtown. I was greatly influenced by a personal friendship with Dr. Chafer. I well understood the purpose for which he founded Dallas Seminary. It was to train men to be able to dig in the Word and analyze it verse by verse and line by line. I was in thorough agreement with Dr. Chafer's view and the purpose of the seminary, and I attended there. When I graduated, I had accomplished the work for my master's and the degree which I received, and also had done my doctorate. I was thoroughly prepared to fulfill what the ministry required. The Word of God is very clear and very lucid on the responsibility of the pastor-teacher. But I came to a church which, like so many fundamentalist and independent churches, had other ideas and made demands upon me which were incompatible with what the Word of God teaches. And so there was an inevitable period of struggle, but in the end it was the Bible classes, the daily communication of the Word that counted. At that time, in the Quonset Hut, both the tape and publications ministries were attempted by individuals and by their individual initiative. None of these were particularly encouraged by me, and that's putting it rather mildly in some cases. There was an occasional and periodic controversy, and some of the congregational meetings will probably match warfare in any dispensation at any time. There was a great controversy over moving from the downtown location. And there were people who stated very dogmatically, God would never bless us anywhere but on that corner. Over a period of time, the impetus of the word and the reasonableness of the congregation decided to move from that place. And in making that decision, we were off to, first of all, a false start. Through a great deal of effort and work on the part of the Board of Deacons at that time, a package was put together on Memorial Drive near downtown. The package included about four acres, and there was a very intricate system for acquiring it because the land was owned by many people. But after a period of real struggle, the land was that we were about to close the deal, and in the congregational meeting, which would have closed it, I definitely felt led of the Lord to put a stop to it, which I did. Much, of course, to the consternation of those who had worked so diligently on it. 
That was on a Sunday night. On Monday night there was a specially called deacon's meeting to which I was invited as special guest. <laughs> the purpose, of course, was to roast me thoroughly, and of course that was done. From then on, of course, we started out on a true lead, not without controversy. I was very favorably disposed toward the property on which we find ourselves at the present time, along with many of the other people. However, the opposition was very vociferous, and I was accused of wanting this property, which was on the outskirts of town and really out in the sticks, because it was so close to where I was residing, which, of course, it was close to where I was residing. I was living at Lamar Terrace at the time. Actually, we are now in the center of town, but of course that's all another story. The property was purchased through the usual constitutional means, and a committee went to work on planning a building. The planning committee did an excellent job. I don't think there's any such thing as a perfect building. I think in many ways this accomplishes just about 99% of perfection. We have only 1% because we have as our front door a door that is rarely ever used, and this we did not quite anticipate. And then we have a door which is used all the time and it's so narrow that it clogs up off the parking lot. I think we can include those as failures under 1%. I think the rest of this building, its design, its concepts, has been phenomenal and has stood the test of time, and I think the history of our church vindicates the type of planning that went into this building. All of the moving from downtown was accomplished with a minimum number of problems and a maximum num amount of efficiency. The Bible classes increased and TNP became a reality. And at present, the ministry of TNP is so widespread that it includes 50 states and 75 foreign countries. In fact, Baraka Church is better known outside of Houston than in Houston. Last week, our expansion reached its culmination. Baraka Church paid off its entire indebtedness. This means that as of now, over $2 million worth of property and improvements have been paid off within 11 years. I don't know if this is any kind of a record, but I do know this represents the fantastic grace of God toward us as a congregation. When it comes to personnel, the ministry of this church is definitely a lot not like others, and it makes personal adjustments very difficult for those who are newcomers, especially those who are newcomers with a religious or a ritualistic background. The emphasis inevitably is away from religion and legalism and toward Bible doctrine. And therefore, under exegetical categorical teaching with authority, an adjustment is sometimes necessary. But for those who are positive toward doctrine and have always wanted to know what the Word of God teaches, this transition can and has been made in thousands of cases. However, criticism from the outside and controversy on the inside are inevitable. Some of this flack, which we experience from time to time, is actually a challenge to the authority of this pulpit and to my teaching ministry. And some of it has been both academically and experientially dishonest and even unmoral. I have stated just as clearly and as honestly and sometimes as forcibly as possible what my policies are as the pastor of this church. They are obviously in contradiction to some of the ideas of the membership. From time to time, conspiracies have existed during my 21 years, but inevitably God's grace is greater than the machinations of certain members of the congregation. Historically today, we live in a day of a weak clergy, a day of apostasy. For this reason, it is very difficult for people to orient 
to authority in the pulpit. This is a biblical concept, but it is not necessarily a, con a happy one as far as some people are concerned, or a popular one. And therefore, preconceived notions often get banged in the head, and some survive and some do not. The only way to benefit from the ministry of this pulpit is to be in daily contact with it. And this can only be accomplished by attendance at not only our worship services on Sunday, but our Bible classes. For those who are handicapped or those who live out of the city, this cannot be accomplished through face-to-face -face teaching, but tapes are available and even publications have been helpful. The longer I live and the more I study the Word of God, and I do, the more I have come to realize the importance of authoritative Bible teaching, the more I have come to realize the value of face-to-face -face teaching, and as I have stated before, the more intolerant I have become of those who are seed pickers, a little from here, a little from there, church tramps that jump from one place to another, unstable people who come for a while and then go for a while, pouters, people who simply do not understand and cannot be objective enough to continue with this ministry. And needless to say, at various stages of this ministry, certain people have peeled off. Those who have departed without comment have done the very fine Christian thing. They have moved out without trying to stir out trouble, and they have gone elsewhere and are accepting the authority of some other pastor teacher. This is not true of others who stay only to attend occasionally and to make the congregational meetings to vote no. These people, among whom some are here today, will probably benefit to some extent from this passage, and if they do not, I see nothing for them in the future but a maximum amount of discipline from the Lord, not from me. Often ignored in some great administrative thrust, some expansion concept, is the fact that Baraka Church cannot exist without the grace of God. We often become so involved in the successful administration or the successful planning or an excellent and a well-done piece of work that we forget that even though we administer as unto the Lord or do the best we can, this church does not depend on good administration or good anything. It depends on who and what the Lord is. It depends on having the right pastor, and it depends upon the right pastor communicating Bible doctrine under the right concept, exegetical, isagogical, categorical teaching. So this ministry can only exist to the extent that it is recognized and depends upon God's grace and what God has provided. And when I say what God has provided, I'm talking about the pastor. I'm talking about myself. Or up to this point, at least, I'm the right pastor for this church. And therefore, its modus operandi must always be compatible with grace and compatible with what the Word of God teaches. And God in His grace has given authority to the pastor-teacher through the spiritual gift which is mentioned in Ephesians 4.11. And therefore, this morning, we are going to examine or review briefly this passage, which is so pertinent to the life of this church. We are going to examine the purpose and the function of the pastor-teacher in Ephesians 4.11-13. through 13. You will notice that God's grace is paramount immediately because we read, He gave. The verb for giving is always a sign of divine grace. The subject is God. The beneficiary here is the believer in the church age. This is an aorist active indicative of the verb didomi. Didomi, D-I-D-O-M-I, is the common Koine Greek word for giving. The subject is God the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 11. The beneficiary are certain but not all believers in the church age at any given time. God the Holy Spirit, aorist tense, at a point of time, salvation, 
sovereignly bestows a spiritual gift on every believer, but he sovereignly bestows a special gift on some believers. And this is the gift which we are going to study this morning. This gift is not earned or deserved or worked for. The gift, pastor, teacher, is confined to those who are male believers and to very few at that. He gave some, not all believers, but some, two men death. Looks like this in the Greek. T-O-U-S-M-E-N-D-E. -E. Three particles to limit and to separate and to put into a special category certain spiritual gifts. Certain spiritual gifts carry authority, and certain spiritual gifts do not. Now you will notice in this passage that there are actually four spiritual gifts mentioned. These four have something in common. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. All of them are communication gifts. All of them are gifts that carry some sort of authority. Two of them are confined to the pre-canon period of the church age, a period from roughly 30 to 96 A.D. Those two are the first two, apostles, the highest gift ever bestowed on the church, and a temporary gift until the canon was completed. The same thing is true of prophets. Prophets existed until the canon of Scripture replaced that particular gift. The post-canon period has two communication gifts only. Evangelism, we will not study that except to note in passing that it is a communication gift in a specialized field and carries authority where the communication of the gospel is concerned. And even whether the evangelist is always true to the word or not, it does carry with it a certain divine blessing which can be observable in almost any period where some evangelists are accurate and some are not. But the gift God recognizes and blesses. The gift in which we are interested this morning is the one that pertains to us as a church as I began now my 21st year as pastor. That is the gift of pastor-teacher. And this is where we will resume our study. He gave some pastor-teachers. The word for pastor is a noun here in the accusative plural, poimen. P-O-I-M-E-N. Poimen means shepherd. It is definitely a noun connoting authority. It means shepherds having authority over sheep. And by implication, the shepherd is qualified to care for the sheep, and the sheep are not qualified to care for themselves. That's why they have a shepherd. So the first of the two hyphenated words in this spiritual gift definitely deals with authority. This is one of the hardest things for independent fundamentalists to understand, that there is authority in any organization and that there is divinely constituted authority in the gift of pastor-teacher. And if you have the right pastor, right pastor, right congregation, he has the final authority without exception and without equivocation. He is the shepherd. And no sheep can ever suddenly turn into a shepherd following this analogy. The only thing the sheep can do is either reject or accept the ministry, benefit or not benefit from the ministry. And the ministry is tied up in the next noun, teacher, the Greek word didaskalos. D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-O-S. Some of you may notice that my Greek is a little shaky. That's not because I'm sick. I am, but it's because I haven't written Greek in so long. Didaskalos means a public teacher. And it refers to the function and the primary, primary responsibility of the gift. The whole emphasis at Dallas Theological Seminary when I was there and when Dr. Chafer was alive, when I was there as a student, was exegetical, categorical teaching, line by line, verse by verse, word by word. 
Now they have gone for a system that you simply cannot believe. It is totally in opposition to what the purpose for which the seminary was founded. The concept of the big idea, the slurring over of exegesis, the fact that one of our students here at this church, an excellent student, a straight-A student, was actually called in by a member of the faculty and chewed out because he was spending too much time on Greek and Hebrew, and not a subject of faculty discussion. And yet the member of the faculty was shocked when he learned that he made A's in all of his courses. There is an opposition everywhere to the things for which Baraka Church stands, in every level of life and at every point, and certainly in a time of apostasy and in a time of confusion. In your own mind, you must recognize who is your shepherd. Now, you can jump around from commentary to commentary, from book to book, or you can jump from church to church. This is bad for you, not good. You say, but I'm getting along well. That's your ego saying that. How much doctor you really know? Some of you are so far behind in the ministry of this church that it's pitiful. Some of you peeled off at rebound. Some of you peeled off at spirituality by grace. Some of you ridiculed but never gave a hearing to the angelic conflict. Some of you laughed and ridiculed Gap and the edification complex. And in your parties you even spend time laughing about these things, ridiculing these things, even though they are definite concepts from the Word of God and concepts of which you are not familiar. Now, I'm going to be very frank with you and lay it on the line as much as I am capable of doing so. And this is it. Either I must go or you must go. Now, I'm pastor of Baraka Church, and I'll make it very clear where I stand on any subject in which you're interested. I'm never again going to have a member of the Board of Deacons who isn't a man who keeps up with the thrust of this church. And that means a person who comes to Bible class and to Sunday services. I'm not going to ever have the confusion whereby people have moved hundreds and thousands of miles to Houston to get Bible class and to get a job here. And some of them have left because they have come into contact with leadership, people who are not with this ministry at all, who are critical of this ministry, and without waiting to see what was going on, became disillusioned and left. Now, that's not good. I am tired of having in positions and on committees those who are in opposition and who have used those committees as a means of expressing their opposition. It's all over. We are not going to have Sunday school teachers who do not attend Baraka Church and obviously who do not know what's going on and who have lost track of the thrust and the ministry of this church a long time ago. Now, when you find people that start ridiculing the angelic conflict, gap and edification complex, emotional revolt of the soul and other breakthroughs. When you find people who are snippety about Jeremiah, you are looking at people who are in opposition to my authority as pastor of this church. And I advise you as members and as sheep, do not pay attention to these people. They are out of line. Do not be influenced by these people who appear to be so smart and are really so dumb about one thing in life, authority. As long as I'm pastor, I have seen the need for greater protection of the sheep. And sometimes sheep have to be protected from sheep. And I intend to use my prerogatives as sons of the Lord in that direction. Now, this is a congregational type government. You can get rid of me. As long as I'm here, I'm going to stick by my guns. Because this church needs, in the worst kind of a way, authority, and that authority has been set aside by some, in contrary to this passage we have today. That's why I think it is very apropos to set aside Jeremiah for the morning and to take a good look at some principles found in a very pertinent passage. Now the word pastor is poimene. The word teacher is didaskalos, and these are two Greek words to describe the ministry. The shepherd is the final authority. We do not have a board of sheep that dictate to him. 
His responsibility is teacher, didaskalos, and that means one person teaching a group, not one-on-one. -on -one. There is a third Greek word, diakonos, which is used for the pastor. Looks like this. It's the word from which we get deacon, D-I-A-K-O-N-O-S, diakonos. Now, diakonos is a flexible word and used three ways in the New Testament. One, it is used in a political sense in Romans 13.4, leaders of state. It is used in a general sense, the universal ministry of the believer, in several passages in 2 Corinthians 3.6.4.1.5.18.6.3. In fact, it will be found that way in our passage. It also has a specialized use for the pastor of the local church in 1 Corinthians 3.5, Ephesians 3.7, Colossians 1.23, Colossians 4.7, 1 Thessalonians 3.2, and 1 Timothy 1.12. These are specialized uses. So that diakonos is primarily an administrative term in contrast to poimain. Poimain, or shepherd or pastor, this word is definitely authority. Diakonos is used of the pastor. He is also an administrator. And along with poimain, he is chief administrator. Didaskos with poimain means he is teacher. He is the teaching authority of the local church. All right, we now have three Greek words. We'll collect a couple more. The first one is poimain, pastor, a reference to the principal authority in the local church. The word teacher is the function. Didaskalos means to study and teach. The third is diakonos, which means he is also the chief administrator. It doesn't mean he does all the administration, but he is the final authority in administration, diakonos. The, th the fourth word is presbuteros, from which we get our English word presbyterian. <coughs> P-R-E-S-B-U-T-E-R-O-S. This word is generally translated elder. It actually is, that's a good translation for the day in which it was written because the word means old man. But it means old man not in the sense of age, but in the sense of authority and rank. The word is often used in the plural like the elders at Ephesus or the elders of Jerusalem. This does not mean that there was a plurality of elders in one church. It means there was a plurality of pastors in one location. The elders in Ephesus are the pastors in Ephesus, and each pastor had his own local church. The elders in Jerusalem, the same thing is true. The elders in Jerusalem were pastors. Each one had his own church. So presbuteros, and by the way, presbuteros is used with the verb poimino, not only in Acts 17, but in 1 Peter 2. And this indicates that poimino, the teach of the shepherd and the presbuteros are synonymous people. Now, many of you have come from churches where elders were church officers. That is definitely out of line. Some of you have come from local churches where there was a multiplicity of what they call teaching elders. That is also out of line. Neither is compatible with the teaching of the Word of God. One presbuteros for one congregation. And those of you who are wise in these things could easily say, Amen, and one's enough. <laughs> Our fifth word is episkopos, from which we get episcopal. E-P-I-S-K-O-P-O-S. -P -P episkopos means, well, it's translated bishop, so you'll know what we're talking about. Episcopos actually emphasizes, again, administrative rulership. Episcopos is really an overseer in charge of an estate or an administrator in charge of a business or a farming project in the ancient world. Episcopos then emphasizes authority in policy making. See, each one has... or a farming project in the ancient world. Episcopos then emphasizes authority in policy making. See, each one has an emphasis, pastor or poimain, authority over the entire flock, absolute authority. 
teacher is function. Diakonos, deacon or minister, has to do with administration. But administration is separated from policy by these two words. Diakonos is simply administration. Episcopos is a policy of administration. Presbyteros or elder simply means the one who is in charge, the old man, the final leader of the church. Now, this is merely a brief resume because we have studied this passage before. But the purpose of this resume is to discover now what is the responsibility, in brief, of the pastor of a local church. As I begin my 21st year, what is my responsibility according to biblical standards? Not the standards set up by a seminary or preconceived notions in your own mind. What is my responsibility before the Lord? And while there are several other passages that cover this general subject, this is the shortest and the one that guarantees us getting out at a reasonable time, which is always, of course, of paramount interest in this particular service. In verse 12, we have the threefold purpose of the communication gift of the pastor-teacher. There will be other amplifying purposes stated in verse 13. Each one of the three purposes is introduced by the English word for, for the perfecting of the saints, purpose number one, for the work of the ministry, purpose number two, for the edifying of the body of Christ, purpose number three. Each one of these words, Greek words, represented by the translation for, is a preposition. However, we have a different preposition. We have two prepositions used in this particular case. Let's take our first four. Our first four is pros, P-R-O-S, plus the accusative case. And as you are well familiar with this point of syntax, pros plus the accusative means face to face with something or someone. Hence, the pastor-teacher so communicates as to bring his flock face to face with himself. And this is compatible with the word teacher, didaskos. The perfecting of the saints, whatever it is, we haven't discovered yet. It demands face to face teaching. It demands a pastor-teacher. You see, at the time of writing, they didn't even have tape recorders. They had a pastor. They didn't even have public address systems. They had a pastor standing in front of a group of people as I am standing in front of you. There is no substitute for face-to-face -face teaching. And the first commentaries ever written in the church age were called pseudepigrapha under this same concept. Face-to-face -face teaching is an absolute essential. And that's why the doors are open and why you have so many opportunities. For those who reside in Houston and are members of Baraka Church or positive toward the ministry here, your tape recorder is supplemental, not primary, unless you're handicapped, and then, of course, that's very understandable and very reasonable. For those who live in other areas where they cannot find a pastor-teacher communicating God's Word, and the tape recorder becomes a bona fide means of teaching. But pros plus the accusative inevitably demands face-to-face -face teaching. Not face-to-face -face with a commentary or someone's devotional emotional book or some weirdo who's in town for a short time to confuse you or some lame brains conference You either decide to stick with one person and get the Word of God and get the categories and get the system, or go somewhere else and be a seed picker. If you want to be a seed picker, you obviously do not belong here, because Baraka Church has a thrust and a ministry that is so far ahead of your commentaries and so far ahead of your emotional, devotional, entertaining speakers that they're not even in the same league. And of course, you don't know that, I'm telling you. Now, you take it or leave it. Either stay or get out. But don't stick around and be an irritated, irresponsible 
type of opposition. This does not imply that all opposition is irresponsible. It does imply that there is and has been irresponsible opposition here. Bible doctrine is more necessary now than at any time in church history. And the constant intake of doctrine is more necessary. And for those who find excuse not to take in Bible doctrine on a daily basis, there is no excuse, and I'll be the first to tell you. You do not have an excuse unless you actually work when a Bible class is in session. Neither your little pleasures, your fun activities, your tired and exhausted body, or anything else is an excuse. I always have to laugh at these people who are too tired to come. Did you know I was too tired to come this morning? Not that I have had any rest. Why, listen, I had 12 hours in bed, but I'm still too tired to come. I can hardly believe I've been in bed that long. I'm too tired to be here today, so what? And some of you will be too tired to come to Bible class. You're too, too this, too that. You're full of jealousy. You're full of bitterness. You're full of vindictiveness. Some of you are males but not men. That's why you'll never take it from me. You have yet to be a man. But some of you ought to grow a backbone, and I can give you one in a hurry. If you cannot respond to the authoritative teaching of this pulpit, and if you cannot respond to the policies that are made by me, then it's time for you to pick up and move on. The thrust of Baraka Church has outgrown you. It has outstripped you in every way. You are still back at the starter's mark or about 10 yards down the track at rebound. You're still nitpicking at the angelic conflict. You still don't understand the soul and the frontal lobes and you still don't understand GAP, and you don't want to understand GAP because you think you're smarter than everyone else, and therefore can pick it up in a hurry. You have lost the consistency, the thrust, the slugging it out, the night by night, the day by day teaching from this pulpit. For those of you who have missed Jeremiah, you, have, you are the loser. For those of you who don't like Jeremiah, you're a loser. This is one I've heard say, I'm coming back to Bible class when you see with Jeremiah. There may not be a church here when I'm through with Jeremiah. It may be God or dumb wrong. Now, we are past the stage in this country when you can fool around with your little pleasures and put anything above Bible doctrine. We are going to shut down making tape orders for a week over in TMP. We have to shut down. The demands have been so great that they have far exceeded the income. And we're going to have to shut down for a week to catch up. But if anyone here today who has not been attending Bible class, and that includes a lot of you, and you would like to catch up on the Jeremiah tapes we will give them to you if you will come over. And I won't be here, so I won't know who you are. <laughs> we will give them to you, the last half, which will put you up to date on a lot of breakthroughs. Now, some of you get my breakthroughs secondhand, and immediately they do not seem to appeal to your preconceived notions, and you belittle them. Your pettiness, your triviality thinking, either ought to move you out of here or you ought to get with it, one or the other. There's no longer middle ground in this church. The nice people who are going to get a pat on the head if they show up once in a while. We're not interested in that. And those who are in opposition and are petty and are critical, and are constantly influencing others, it's time for you to go. We're going to have a great influx of people. I have been on long distance with people all week who are getting ready to move to Houston. I don't want them to meet you. I don't want them to go to your parties. 
I don't want them to go to your parties and hear Bob Thieves, a good Bible teacher, but I want to give these people a chance. They, have a, they, have a, they ought to have a right to crack a doctor, and you had yours, you just blew it. Now, what do you suppose perfecting means? Face-to-face -face teaching. For what reason? Perfecting? No. There is not a perfect person on this earth. There isn't anyone who is even close to being perfect. Well, why did they translate this perfect? Because perfect 300 years ago did not mean what perfect means today. The only people who are perfect are people who are perfect in their own eyes, who have a case of self-righteousness plus ego that is unbeatable. But the word in the Greek does not mean perfect, so we can all relax. Kat artismos. K-A-T-A-R-T-I-S-M-O-S. Kat artismos means training and equipping for combat. Face-to-face -face teaching trains and equips the believer for combat. The believer is called here a saint. Every believer is a saint. So literally, what is the first purpose of the pastor-teacher? To communicate doctrine, to constantly communicate doctrine, face-to-face -face with his congregation, so face-to-face -face with training and the equipping of the saints for combat. Every time you come to a Bible class, every time you attend a service, you are being trained and equipped for the angelic conflict and for the other conflicts which exist in the cosmos. The second purpose is stated in a very interesting way, but we have a new preposition. This time the word for is ice, E-I-S. Ice is a directional preposition, and it actually refers to and amplifies the function of gap. For the work of the ministry, the word for work here is ergon. Ergon talks about action, E-R-G-O-N. The word for work here indicates not simply overt manifestation of production, but it means inner unseen production. Ergon has to do, first of all, with the correct function of the soul. The heart, or the dominant lobe, with its doctrine, dominating the soul. Ergon has to do, therefore, with unseen as well as overt production. Agathos, which is generally used for, for divine good, the one that looks like this, has to do with only overt divine good. But you see, there are a great many things which you do not do and you're still doing. The intake of doctrine, the use of doctrine in the soul. The word for ministry here is diakonos again, and this time it refers to the universal ministry of the believer. And the principal gap is the basis for the production of divine good. There is no place for human good in the plan of God. And all divine good is not some overt activity like prayer or witnessing. It's actually listening to the teaching of the Word. It is actually the function of gap. It is the erection of the edification complex. And therefore, we are led to a third purpose, also introduced by the preposition ice. E-I-S. The preposition ice introduces a third purpose, edification complex. This is directional again, and this is the direction in which we must move. The word edifying is oikotome. O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E. Oikotome. Oikotome is used for the erection of the edification complex of the soul. One of the sources of, of amusement among those who have rejected the ministry here. The edification complex is the sign of a mature believer. And the sooner one erects an edification complex, the better. Now, literally, this verse says, 
three purposes. One, face-to-face -face with the training and equipping of the saints for combat. That's face-to-face -face teaching. Two, for the production of the ministry, inner and overt. Three, and the ministry is of every believer. Three, for the edification of the body of Christ. Now this leads then to the summary of the objective. Why are these three purposes involved in the ministry of the pastor-teacher? Verse 13 begins with an adverb, till, which is the adverb macri. M-E-C-H-R-I, macri. And it means until to establish an objective. The objective is now summarized. Until we all, all believers. Now we all has great significance here. All believers have to be under the authority of some local church, of some communicator of doctrine. Verse 11 says the gift communicates, pastor, teacher. Verse 12 says there are three purposes in communicating the Word of God. Now, we all means that when you find people and organizations floating loose who are not under some local church somewhere where the pastor communicates doctrine, you are looking at the flotsam and the jotsam of revolution. And this can include everything from Jesus Freaks to some young people's organization which actually takes money from the local church but doesn't like the local church. Now obviously many local churches are in a state of apostasy. Obviously many local churches are operating on some form of human viewpoint, some programism. Nevertheless, when a person is positive toward the Word and wants to mature, there's only one way he can do it, and that is under the authoritative teaching of some pastor. That's why people go to the tapes. If in their local area they cannot find a pastor who is communicating doctrine on an exegetical basis, they go to the tape recorder. And that's a bona fide move on their part. But here in Houston, that's not a bona fide move at all. Now it says, until we all, all believers, come. Now the word come is not found here at all. Cot on tao, eris active subjunctive. Looks like this. K-A-T-A-N-T-A-O. Cot on tao. This word means to arrive at an objective, to cross a goal, to attain or reach a goal. The eris tense means in the point of time when the three purposes of the previous verse are fulfilled. The first one is face-to-face -face teaching. That is fulfilled in a period of time, depending upon the concentration of teaching on the part of the pastor. As far as this church is concerned, it's a maximum concentration, the equipping of the saints. The second purpose is the production of the ministry. This is only possible through doctrine. The third is edification. These three, when they are fulfilled through the teaching ministry, pastor-teacher, the Daskos, then we arrive at an objective. Till we all arrive at an objective. Now the objective must be defined, and it is defined by a series of prepositional phrases, each one amplifying the other. We start out with ice. We have a prepositional phrase, and that is amplified by another ice phrase, and that is amplified by another ice phrase, and so on. This is a verse of amplification and restatement of the objective which is reached. The first phrase, in the unity of faith. Now the word ice is with reference to. Remember, it is an objective preposition. It always has an object. It's always moving in a direction. And here it moves in the direction of what is called unity. This is the accusative singular of anotes, which looks like this. E-N-O-T-E-S. Now, anotes really means objective. Not unity in the sense everyone's agreeing with everyone else and so on. Not brotherhood. Unity here means objective. It connotes a consistency of arriving 
Everyone arrives the same way. Everyone arrives through a pastor-teacher communicating, responds to that, the function of GAP, the erection of the edification complex. Mature believers always have a consistent system of doctrine from which to orient and from which to produce. And therefore we have, with reference to the objective of the faith, the faith is actually Bible doctrine. The word pistis, which is used here, P-I-S-T-I-S, is in contrast to another Greek word, pistos, P-I-S-T-O-S. This word is not used. Pistos, generally, with the definite article, refers to doctrine, a system of doctrine. Not just an occasional doctrine, but a doctrine, a system of doctrine, and, of course, in this case, in the right lobe, in the frame of reference. All right, what is the objective of the communication gift? Until we all, all believers, arrive at the goal with reference to the objective of a consistent system of doctrine, of the faith, and of the knowledge. So our next word is epinosis. Epinosis is doctrine assimilated under gap. Epinosis. Well, first of all, we have gnosis in the... Here we have it, first of all, here in the left lobe. This is the staging area. That's simply, that's simply comprehension. And then pistis, which we've just had, getting it systematized. Pistis transfers it to the human spirit where it becomes epinosis. Epinosis cycles up into the right lobe, into the frame of reference where doctrine is stored. Doctrine stored in the human spirit is for the purpose of erecting an edification complex. That's when you reach maturity, when this is finished. Doctrine stored here is used for the purpose of application, orientation, and so on, and for dominating the soul with, human view, uh, with divine rather than human viewpoint. When the heart controls the soul, that is the right lobe, then we have the domination of the soul by Bible doctrine. All of this is stated in the first prepositional phrase. The epinosis of the Son of God. The Son of God is Jesus Christ, the revealed member of the Godhead, and when this is completed, plus H, and just before it, love, when love is completed as part of the edification complex, there is a maximum love toward Jesus Christ, who is the revealed member of the Godhead. And as goes our love for Christ, so goes our love for the Father and for the Holy Spirit, who are the non-revealed members of the Godhead. The Son of God then refers to Jesus Christ, and this is an exhale of category two love maximum as a result of an edification complex as a result of Bible doctrine in the right lobe. Now the second prepositional phrase, unto the perfect man. Again, we have the preposition ice, which states a direction or an objective. Ice plus the word for perfect. This time we have an adjective, telios. Telios, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. Telios, as an adjective, refers to a believer with an edification complex. And it should be translated here as a mature man. But it must be understood that maturity includes the completion of the edification complex of the soul. The word for man is the Greek word aner, which means noble man. A-N-E-R. And once a believer reaches maturity, he can consider himself as a part of Christian nobility. Now we have another prepositional phrase following, this time unto, which is ice, which states the objective of gap, unto the measure of the stature. The word for measure is metron, and it actually means here standard, unto the standard of the stature. The word for stature, halakia, looks like this, H-E-L-I-K-I-A. Halakia actually means full age or prime of life. You can reach your prime and then maintain it for a long time. The sooner you get an edification complex, the better. You can get an edification complex within four or five years of concentrated study very easily. And then from then on, you're in your prime till the day you depart from this earth. You're prime spiritually, which is what counts the most. So the word stature does not mean stature, but it means prime of life. The word measure doesn't mean measure, it means standard. Under the standard of the prime of life. And what is the prime of life? Of the fullness 
And the word fullness here refers to the edification complex of Jesus Christ, pleroma, P-L-E-R-O-M-A. Pleroma is Jesus Christ having an edification complex of the soul as the result of his function of gap. And apparently he received this at a very early age, say about 12, according to Luke 2.40 and according to Luke 2.52, and these two must be compared with John 1.14, to see how he spent his entire life almost under this great principle of prime of life spiritually. All right, let's correct the translation or summarize it. Until we all arrive at the objective. The objective is arrived at by the faithful teaching of the pastor-teacher. There are three purposes stated in the previous verse. Now verse 13 again, until we all arrive at the objective with reference to the unity of the faith. The faith is a system of doctrine. And the full knowledge, the epinosis of the Son of God. Unto the mature nobleman. Unto the standard of maturity, of the full development of Christ. Now, this briefly, and in a few minutes, is a most comprehensive and concentrated statement of the objective of the pastor. There is nothing in this to indicate that a pastor ever does any catering to people ever does anything but study, teach, and as a result of study, teach, inevitably, he will be a policy maker and a pace setter as far as administration, as far as the trend of a local church. A local church can change its trend overnight because of who and what the pastor teacher is. I have seen this recently in a church out in the western states, a church that was formerly a very strong fundamental church and is now a weak church on its way to liberalism. And all of this has happened in the last three years. Change of pastors, a whole thing changes. My objective is not going to change. I'm going to teach the Word of God. I'm going to teach in Bible class. We'll continue in Jeremiah until we reach a stopping point. We'll start again. We'll resume Jeremiah again tonight. I'm not going to permit the type of thing that has been so detrimental to people coming in and to people who do not understand. Now, if this policy, if you're not in agreement with it, and you can find enough people who are not, then it's time for me to go. But if the majority of the people are with me, then I'm going to stay and I, this is going to be the policy. And that means it's time for you to go. Uh, no one can teach Bible doctrine without authority, and you don't have a commentary, and you don't have someone around town, and you don't have someone you can hippity hop off to and come back here. You make up your mind which way you're going. You're not that smart. You're not nearly as smart as you think you are. Now, it's a two-way street. I need you and you need me, but this is the way it's going to be on Y plus 22 and Y plus 23 and Y plus 24. You're going to get doctrine. When you get out of line, you're going to be told about it. And never again am I going to have boards of deacons and people on committees like I've had in the past who have used that particular thing to try to break down the teaching as it comes from this pulpit. All right, that's the end of the anniversary message. Now tonight we'll get back with it. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed. The closing moments of this service are dedicated to those of you who have not made the greatest decision in life.